So I'm the executive director of the Air Barrier Association and I've had the privilege to be actually involved in the formation back in 2000. We do have two other members of ABBA here. We have uh, Brian Strike from Tremco, he's our vice chairman, and beside him Andrew Dunlap uh, from S the Smith Group, and he is uh, our chairman of, or co-chair of our research committee. Um, so I'm going to start off with basically a bit of information about ABBA, but before I start, hopefully everybody has uh, a place where you can put your notes and so on. The other thing uh, is if you haven't picked it up, there's a stick available and all the presentations are on the stick. There's also a sample um, project specification that's on here. They're also on the website, you can download them. And there's a audit report to give you an idea and you'll see as we talk about what those things are. And then there's a, just a whole bunch of other information on there. So if you haven't had a chance to pick up the stick, please do that before you go. So we get down to who is ABBA um, and did I miss one? No. So we're, we're basically in almost every state in, in the United States. We got our formation back in 2001 and here's what we have in Ohio. We have 17 contractors, two manufacturers, two testing labs, six building envelope consultants and two licensed field auditors and we'll go through the definitions of what those mean. The other thing that we like to point out is our membership is uh, mainly made up of contractors. Uh, a lot of associations are basically manufacturer driven, we're, we're we believe the industry driven, we're trying to solve the problems that are out in the field. I guess the other thing I should mention is that although we call ourselves the Air Barrier Association of America, we deal with all the control layers. So we wanted to go from the air barrier association to the air and water resistance and vapor barrier and heat barrier association but the acronym got too long and too cumbersome so we're going to leave it as ABBA. Um, but we believe that, <coughs> excuse me, that's important to have a whole mixture of people in the industry and what you have to keep in, in mind is that before basically 2000 there was no industry and, and so a lot of things had to be developed and still got to, to be developed. We've got a tremendous amount of work to do. The other thing I'm, I'm really proud of is ABBA has always maintained that we build everything on a technical basis. So we want it technically correct and scientifically defensible, which means we've got to do a whole lot of work to be able to have that where we are. Um, we're a 501c6, which doesn't mean a whole lot of stuff except that you don't pay uh, income tax. Uh, and the money that, uh, that we make uh, goes back into promoting the industry. Uh, we had a question yesterday is where's our funding come from? And we are not funded by any organization. All our, our monies that come in come from membership and quality assurance and, and basically the services we provide. So we believe that's also important because I personally have seen over the years that you get a lot of groups working together. They get government funding and then the acts comes and government funding isn't there and they sort of go by the wayside. So we wanted to build and have a value proposition to our membership as to why they would join and why they would participate. And <clears throat> so that means that we have a pretty simple uh, objective for the association. We basically want better buildings. That's our whole part. And that's why we had to move from just air barriers into all the other control layers because you can't put an air barrier in the building unless you consider everything else. So that's really important. And like any sort of trade association, we have a board of directors that guides us. They're elected by the members. We have uh, currently 23 directors out there. Uh, Matt is one of, uh, Jim Brony is one of our members that we have on the board of, of directors. So we're always wanting to get input into the organization from what's happening in the field and how do we solve some of the problems out there. I'm not going to go through all the details but this is basically the structure. You'll see the two main things though is the technical committee and the quality assurance uh, program committee. So in the, in the um, committee's uh, scope of work we have quality assurance contractors, education, marketing, governance, sort of the, the, tech, uh, the main things. And in our, in our main technical committee which we've got about 45 members in there, we break it down into task groups of whatever we're trying to develop there and that's where basically all the work is done. And then the other big uh, part is our research committee and then we have the task groups underneath those research committees there. 
So, um, and by the way, the, the work list for the technical committee is four pages long and the work list for the, the research committee is almost as long there. We keep adding projects, even though we're, we're finishing projects and moving on, we keep understanding and realizing that we still have to do a whole lot of work. So we do a lot of education. We have two objectives for the association. Education, site quality assurance. That's it. We established those back in 2001 and we go back and revisit them and so on and so forth. But we still maintain that's really what needs to be done. And we find that the education is really, really important because there's a lot of um, miscommunication and confusion of all these control layers and how do they work and how do they interact. And actually what I would suggest to you guys is the more we understand about buildings, or the more we try and learn about buildings, the more we understand that we don't really know how buildings work. Um, just a side story, we, I was at a presentation in Boston a number of years ago, and the presenter was saying, well, this building envelope stuff, it's not rocket science. And I was about to get up and, you know, counter that argument, and he said, um, I know that's true. And I sort of looked at him, and he says, I used to work for NASA. And says, NASA was a lot simpler. And when you stop and think of it, we sent people to the moon on a calculator, basically, and brought them back. Because the laws that they could work with don't change. And so they could calculate, you shoot here, and eventually the moon comes and, you know, we make the connection. Buildings aren't that simple. The other thing that, that you should probably see and pick up as we go throughout the day is that we're building buildings different. And when we build buildings different, you're going to have different reactions to it. So that's why education and quality assurance uh, are the two main things and then we get into standards and training um, is a big thing for us. We, talk, um, I, we talked about uh, the research and the pictures that you see there is probably our first research project. This goes back to about 2006, 2007 and this was a project to basically prove that tight buildings save energy from loose buildings because back in those days we had a lot of opposition you know who cares about airtight buildings and why are they important and all the rest of the stuff so um, the Department of Energy funded Oak Ridge National Laboratories to do a lot of work and there was um, laboratory work and modeling and then the building that you see there was a field uh, research and this is a building that the industry paid for and built at Syracuse University um, it's two-story and it's still there and we wanted to have it someplace where it would stay and people could use. Now why did we pick Syracuse? Um, the leader, the project leader from, Syrac uh, from Oak Ridge National Laboratory says it's the worst place it could be uh, in the United States and I think that's a compliment though but we needed something that had a lot of moisture and a lot of wind and a lot of snow and so on but the, the irony is that uh, his name is, is uh, Andre Desjardins uh, he didn't want to go to Syracuse in the wintertime, so our meetings were always in the summertime. Uh, but it was really interesting because we got everybody to work together. And one of the outcomes with this, and all, oh, by the way, all these research reports are on our website. One of the outcomes we found is that we're not handling, we're not modeling air leakage properly. We're just picking numbers out of the air. We have no basis for what we're putting into ASHRAE 90.1 and IECC and so on. Uh, we also did um, a called drain, dr dr drainage and drying project because we have all the issues of how do we drain waters and do they really dry and do you need an airspace and how wide is that airspace and so on. And we've, we've continued to work with a lot of research projects. Every time we see a problem in the field, we try and deal with it. We had um, an architectural firm not too far from here that came back to us and said, you know, we really like what you're doing, we use a quality assurance program, but you know what, when the air barrier contractor's all done, our cladding guys come and put thousands of holes in it. Is that a problem? And I said to them, I can't add to that. We don't actually know. So that's one of our research projects that, that uh, is being headed up by Andrew. And we need to, to understand that. So the leakage of fasteners, whether it's uh, fasteners through the air barriers or for the cladding system or whatever, uh, for both air leakage and for the water leakage is actually a, a big question that nobody has an answer for. So that's the top of our list. 
We also, to do quality assurance, you need proper standards and test methods and so on. So we, we also develop our own and we work very heavily with ASHRAE and ASTM and, and other ones. <clears throat> the top one is the Army Corps of Engineers protocol. And that's important. They asked us to work with this, so that we did, and, and we basically met every week for three years to go through their protocol. Now their protocol is, is a combination of a test method and a, a project specification. It's sort of a mix map. But that's important because the Army Corps of Engineers was the first organization to have a performance requirement for air barriers. So they didn't really care how you got there, but at the end of the day, the building was tested and you had to meet a very, what was considered a very tight requirement, 0.25 cubic feet per square foot at a pressure difference 1.57. And if you didn't, you basically didn't get your money. And it was interesting with the people I dealt with, uh, the first contractors were involved with it, their comments, well, this is stupid, this is crazy, this is ridiculous, you shouldn't have this requirement, and on and on. And then they did the second project. And the second project was, well, I'm starting to understand it, but I really think it's stupid and shouldn't have it and I shouldn't be held to this standard and so on. And then the third project, it was sort of like, well, why isn't everybody doing this? And there's a lot of reports on that because they've literally done thousands of buildings. And if you take a look at the data points, there's a big swath, but it's all going down. So they started out at 0.25. Which, which was considered very, very tight. They're now going to change it to 0.15 because none of their buildings are coming in at less than 0.10. A lot of the buildings are coming in at 0.05. And the latest one I heard is less than 0.03. Now, what's changed? Nothing. They're using the same material. They're building the same buildings. They're renovating the same buildings. It's the contractors that have understand how they get an airtight building, because you can't see air leakage. So they've just basically understood what they need to do to get a tighter and tighter building. So, and actually, um, I got a call from a general contractor, and made my day, by the way. And the general contractor says, you gotta help me. <coughs> okay, how do we help you? That's what we're here for. Well, I got a letter from the Army Corps of Engineers Okay, because I didn't meet my requirement, 0.25. Okay, not a problem. How, do we, how can we work with you? How can we help you? Well, no, you don't understand. They want to check for me. Okay, what do we want to check for? Well, they want to check for me for the energy that this building will use because it's not as tight as it should be. The energy costs for the next 25 years. Now, it wasn't a video phone, so I did a happy dance. But it was the best uh, phone call. And I think that's one of the things you're going to see in the future. We have a lot of discussion at ASHRAE and ASTM and ICODES and so on about making whole building uh, mandatory requirement. City of Seattle has, that, has had that requirement for years because that's really the only thing that counts. You can't see air leakage. What you do in the lab can be replicated, but you don't know for sure unless you test the whole building. So I think you're going to see that um, come up in the future. The other thing that we spend a lot of time is training and education. This is basically what we're doing here today. And what we found is that there is nobody out there that doesn't need education. And we're trying to help those, whether it's a building official, design professional, even manufacturers. Uh, their salespeople and so on, uh, we've done a lot of training for them to help them understand the basic science behind it and how they work better and how they can present their products better and so on. Um, so we spend a tremendous amount of time out there doing things. And we have our annual conference coming up in May 8th and 9th in Salt Lake City, uh, and we do one every year. We also get into certification. Now, there's a lot of confusion between certification, accreditation, and certificate, and so on. Uh, and it's easy to separate. You can certify a person, a product. You can't certify a company. So if you see ISO 9000 certified, that is wrong. Your ISO 9000 registered is the proper terminology. So we accredit organizations to be able to do something. So that's contractors and so on. We certify people because we follow ISO 17024, which is a confirmation of knowledge, skills, and ability. The people have to know what they should do and they have to be able to do it. 
and then uh, we can get into certifi certification of the sales reps and we can get a certification in the audit. A certificate is what you will probably get today from ABBA, or you will get today from ABBA, which means that you came here. But you don't write a test, you don't have to prove your knowledge, skills, and ability. So a certificate sometimes is called warm seat in, in the, uh, a warm butt in the seat. You know, there's no requirement. And ASTM basically is putting out a certificate program for building commissioning agents. They were going to go down the road of certification and then when they found out it's not quite as easy as it looks, they switched over to, to a cert certificate program. Um, and then uh, being registered simply, ISO 9000 means you've got all the stuff lined up and so on. So because it's the workers out in the field this morning, which is a, not a nice day, how they perform in putting the air barrier on and water resistant barrier and so on will make the building work or not work. That has been a foundation from day one for the association. We really need the workers trained. A lot of other organizations will train the contractor, which means uh, some of the management people and so on. A lot of these people never go out in the field. So we really feel that's the baseline. And, and so we really spend a lot of time in our training and certification of workers. We also do a lot of publications, and there's actually a tremendous amount of information out there on air barriers. Uh, if you go back in history, the um, whole thing started in the 40s, and it was the University of Minnesota who was trying to figure out how to keep water out of buildings, and the result of their research, we started to use building paper. And building paper on the outside of buildings actually helped. It shed the water. It's the precursor to what we use for water-resistant barriers today. But they were still having water in, in, in buildings, especially walls and so on. So they said, well, where's the water coming from? And the hypothesis at that time, well, it's the moisture in the air and it's seeping into our walls and cold climates and condensing. So let's get a vapor barrier out there. So we went gung-ho in vapor barriers all over the United States. We still were getting problems in walls, moisture, frost, ice, all the rest of the stuff, condensation, rot, mildew, corrosion. And as we started to look at, now we're into the 80s, and, the, and we started to look at that, what we found is air leakage was the problem. It's the moisture that's in the air leaking through holes into our building envelope, condensing um, and causing all the problems. And that was compounded back in the 70s. Some of you guys will remember the OPEC oil crisis. And we threw a bunch of insulation into buildings without really understanding what we were doing. We destroyed a lot of buildings, which caused a lot of work for contractors. They liked it. Um, but we started to realize that, wait a minute, this is not so simple. So if we take it to today, now we have air barriers referenced in the building codes. We also have a change in how we're handling vapor barriers. And so in some areas, you don't have to have a vapor barrier. And we'll go through that in the building science that's out there. Um, another key component is we do an evaluation of materials. So as an industry, we set performance requirements for air barrier materials, air barrier materials, water resistant barrier materials, vapor barriers, and heat barriers. And especially for air barriers, it's really important because right now there is no other organization that does this. We don't have ASTM standards, material specification standards. We don't have uh, ASHRAE material specifications. We don't have whatever the organization out there, they don't have it. So rather than you guys having to take a look at a material, look at the spec seat, try and decide whether that's good, bad, and different, will it perform as an air barrier, will it not, will it perform as a water resistant barrier, we got the industry together to sort of make those decisions. So it's now as simple as going on our, our website and looking up a material, and we tell you all the criteria it has to meet, it's all public knowledge, all on the website, and then you can have a level of confidence that if you use that material, it's gonna perform as an air barrier and water resistant barrier out there. So um, uh, manufacturers that go through the process and we got a lot of kicking and screaming because we do want to be thorough on this. It's not a rubber stamp. Uh, they have to provide the test reports. They have to meet the performance requirements. They get to use the logo and they're listed on the website. Um, other types of things that we do is trying to get articles out, social media and so on. We're in a different world today and how we get technology out there has changed. Uh, I was at a... Um, evaluation lab or evaluation organization for materials and I've known the guy forever and he's retiring and his comment to me was if it's not on the internet people believe it's not around and you know he has like two walls all full of books 
and he had one of the new recruits come in and, and the, he's supposed to go do this project and he came back and he says, I can't find anything. And he says, well, did you look over there? Well, no. I looked on the internet. Well, over there you can go through the books and you can find the subject that we're talking about. He says, well, how do I find it in the book? And he says, well, just simply look at the table of contents. You'll see if it's in there. If it's not, put it back and get another. The guy says, what's a table of contents? Okay. Now, the world has changed and we've got to deal with it. So we've got to get some of the things out there. The energy savings calculator is because, going back, I mentioned earlier that we're not really um, properly assessing the energy performance of air barriers. We picked a number out of the air. It's 0.25 cubic feet, no pressure difference given to it and so on. And we throw that in because the modeling program then equates some energy loss to it. And so we, we worked with the National Institute of Science and Technology and Oak Ridge National Laboratories to develop an energy calculator which takes the real world conditions, in this case um, right here, turns that into how much a building would leak and therefore what are the energy savings and so on. So uh, we have three archetypes in there, 52 cities across the United States. We're adding four more archetypes in there. It'll give you an idea of, of your energy savings simply for an air barrier. We want everybody involved in it, and we really, um, we really appreciate the people that spend their time and energy in, in ABBA. And one of the things that I hear time and time again is, uh, we don't mind working with ABBA, helping ABBA, volunteering with ABBA, because you guys are actually doing something. And to me, that's the best compliment we can ever get. And we never want to lose that out there. And then getting to our number one after education, quality assurance, so we accredit contractors, we certify installers, we do site audits, make things sure are done right, and then we bring that information from the field back into better technical uh, reference documents, changes to test reports, whatever it might be. We have that continued uh, flow of information from the field so that we can improve things. So I'm going to take you into building science for a bit. And <clears throat> We believe it's important because uh, building science is basically the physics. How does air flow, moisture flow, and heat flow? And we actually even teach this to installers, and we've been challenged in that, like these workers, what do they need to know building science for? But if you understand the fundamentals of why things are ha happening, it's much easier to make a decision of what you should do out there. So uh, I'd like to walk you through heat flow, air flow, and moisture flow, and some of the issues that we see in the field. Uh, because the nice thing about that is physics doesn't change. It doesn't change if you go back to the 40s, the 60s, the 80s, today. It doesn't change if you're in Boston, if you're in, in Houston, Alaska. How we build our buildings depends on the, the climate conditions, but the physics of heat flow, air flow, and moisture flow doesn't, don't change. So I start out with a few questions. And the first one I always ask is how many in the audience Agree with me that heat rises. Okay. Now, all of the presenters you'll find today are very relaxed. They want you to challenge them, especially those guys. Me, not so much. Uh, but ask questions. Don't agree with everything. Like, don't be backwards. And there is no wrong questions and no wrong answers. Okay. We're here to learn from each other. So, all the people that said heat rise, or anybody, what does heat always do as a physics? Heat always goes from what to what? Hot, Hot to cold, right on. What's the coldest surface in this room? Floor. The floor. So which way does heat flow in this room? From you? Down. OK. Normally somebody says, OK, fine. I'm talking about hot air. Hot air rises. Does hot air rise? Who in the room agrees that hot air rises? You should be picking up the point here, by the way. What has to happen for hot air to rise? Cold air, yeah. So if there's no cold air coming in the room, if this is hot air here, it's not going to go anywhere. We need the cold air, which is denser, to push the hot air up because it's lighter density. So who cares? Well, take it in a building. If you don't have any cold air coming in, you don't have any hot air going out. It's really that simple. 
but that's part of the myth that we see out there. Um, so if we go back to heat always goes hot to cold and we're going to get in a little bit more details on that. Confusion of vapor barriers. Not too long ago in the code it was one perm, every building, every place in the United States. And we get a lot of calls and in fact there's even ASTM standards dealing with vapor barriers and you got to take this vapor barrier and you got to seal it and it's got to be free of holes and you got to overlap it and you got sometimes you got to put caulking and then put pressure bars to keep it together and so on. So does a vapor barrier need to be sealed, free of holes, overlapped and so on? How many people agree with that? Okay, you guys are getting a little get a little bit concerned here. What are we talking about as soon as we talk about free of holes and overlapped and so on? An air barrier, yeah. So if we take this material, well it's kind of hard to see it I guess, but it's a polyethylene dome. And it's a very common vapor barrier used in construction, in residential construction. And many places seal it, lap it, caulk it, do everything. And they call it a vapor barrier. Now it is a vapor barrier, there's no question. But the confusion comes in is that it can also be an air barrier. And I said can. So what's the difference between polyethylene film put on the inside of a building over top of insulation in this climate? What's the difference between putting it on as a vapor barrier and putting it on as an air barrier? How tight it is? Which side yeah. Which side? What side of the insulation comes part of it? Because you want it on the warm side of the insulation, so in this particular case it's on the inside of the building. But if you go to the code for vapor barriers, you hang it. You don't have to seal it. In fact, if we had a hole in this wall that was two feet in diameter, would you have a problem with your vapor barrier? It's only yes or no, guys. <laughs> Yes, that's, that's the answer I get. But if we take a look at it, and I'll walk you through that, if we take a look at it, probably it doesn't matter. If you take a look at the water vapor that's got to work its way through the wall to get to the other side, it probably is not going to make a difference. And the, but the difference is, if you also want that to be your air barrier, now you've got to be very meticulous. It should be at least six mil poly and you've got to use acoustical caulking because that doesn't ever um, sort of dry out and crack and so on and so on. Same material can do two functions but it's installation. Same issue with water resistant barriers on the outside of a building. There's a lot of um, mechanically tack, it, attached flexible something membranes, I forget the exact name. Uh, we call them house wraps or building wraps and things like that. They can put on the outside of your building as a water resistant barrier. Okay. You can use the same material and it can also be your air barrier. What is the difference between the two of them? How do you make it, how do you change from a water resistant barrier to an air barrier? You seal it. Now go on, the, go on anybody's, any manufacturer's website and look up the installation instructions for a water resistant barrier and you'll find, and I'm oversimplifying it, but you'll find you just tack it in place. Okay, get some flashing and so on, go home. Go, go to the other part of the website that requires the installation instruction as an air barrier and you got a whole list of things. The very first thing is two inch diameter plastic head nails that are concave that will push it in, 16 inches by 12 inch spacing, every seam has to be cocked, every penetration has to be sealed and on and on and on. Same material, two different functions, depends on how you install it. So as a vapor barrier, no, you can have holes in it, you can do anything you want, you all meet code. The other thing that you're going to find is that we've moved away from one size fits all, one perm everywhere in the United States, to now we have a vapor barrier, a vapor retarder, and a semi-permeable and a real permeable in our, in our codes. And there's places that we don't require vapor barriers. Why would that be? Let me help you. If you're in this area, Alaska, Fargo, North Dakota, somebody said it already, where do we put the vapor barrier? Inside of the building, warm side of the insulation. So let's go to Houston or Miami, where do you put the vapor barrier there? On the outside. 
So if you're in South Carolina, where do you put the vapor barrier? Good answer. And, and that's the issue. There's a lot of places that adding a vapor barrier actually harms your building. Portland, Oregon, you don't have to have a vapor barrier anymore. The code says you don't have to have it. Why? Go there in the summertime. Could be 95 degrees, 98% relative humidity. That building ain't going to dry to the outside. Go there in the wintertime. Rainy, misty, foggy. That building ain't going to dry to the outside. So if it can't dry to the outside, you put a vapor barrier so it can't dry to the inside, and now you're starting to create a problem. This is all physics. This is just moisture movement in a building. Every building that you built, you built it wrong for a period of time. How many people agree with that? It's true. So why did they work? Why, why isn't this building? It's built wrong for, for the summertime. Why doesn't it fall down? Sometime in the year. Time is a critical thing. So we build buildings here in Cleveland for the right way to build them for a long pe longer period of time than we build them for the wrong period of time. Okay, so they work. Another example, uh, we're, uh, ABBA is headquartered in Boston, so I was there at least twice a month and so on. And they're building a new ter terminal. That terminal is built absolutely backwards. The air, vapor, and water resistant barrier is the outside of the building. All the insulation on the inside, it's Boston. That's backwards. It's not, not meeting code. It works. Why does that terminal work? Think of the function of that building. Yeah, got a lot of people. People need, according to the code, we got to have stuff to breathe. It's air. We have a lot of ventilation, so it works. So we build buildings wrong, and you just got to make sure that that wrong period is a relatively short period of time. This is one we see all the time. We can't put air barriers in the building because we're going to make them too tight, and buildings have to breathe. How many people agree with that? Okay, we've got to go back to what we're talking about. By the way, if you want to show that you understand building science, here's a quick tip. Every question that you get answered, just say, it depends. <laughs> okay? <laughs> nobody can argue with that. Absolutely nobody can argue with that. So everybody will think that you've went to, you know, 100 classes of building, on building science. Let's go back to what we're talking about, breathing. So, and we actually had... ASHRAE standards, and it was more for residential um, retrofits. We tightened these old homes down. There's uh, the program is in question right now, but we used to, to retrofit uh, for low-income families across the United States, literally hundreds of thousands of homes every year. And we had a standard that you air tighten it because we under that program understood the importance of air barriers or air leakage control. But they said you'd tighten it down to this point and then you can't tighten it more because people need the air to breathe. Okay, that standard's been pulled, thank goodness. What are we talking about with breathing? Are we talking about your building leaks is all full of holes? Is that where you want the, the air to come in? No, our, our codes, especially in the commercial side, say you have to have mechanical ventilation. You have to have air coming in. And by the way, you want the air to go where you are, not some corner down and through a crawl space and all over the place. And if we go back to the original, you know, the proper terminology of breathing, um, you guys familiar with Gore-Tex, Gore-Tex jackets and so on, that type of fabric? So what is, wh why would you buy a Gore-Tex jacket? Keep water out. Keep water out? Hey, doesn't that sound like your building? What's the next thing it does? It breathes. It breathes, but before that, yeah, you're, you're ahead of me, work with me here. What's the next thing? Liquid water off you. It's a windbreaker. Sort of like your building. That's what we want on the outside of this building. We want to keep liquid water out, number one. And then we want the air to stop. And then we get into the breathing. Now, do you punch holes through your Gore-Tex jacket so it can breathe? You probably know? should because it doesn't breathe. <laughs> well, I'll take that up with them. <laughs> But it's basically, it's a, if you're exerting yourself, playing hockey, climbing mountains, whatever it is, 
you sweat and the idea is that you want that moisture to go out because if you get wet you're cold you're and if you're out really really cold you're dead so that's a proper terminology of breathing it has nothing to do with air leakage in the building because here's the reasons why that's is an actual wall this is at a trade show and you can't see all the details but if you take a look in in here you don't want to see what's in there rodent droppings and the list goes on and on Okay. Do you really want to breathe that air that's coming through there? And that's the whole idea of putting it. You know what? We didn't get anybody that wanted to try it. <laughs> I don't know. And <clears throat> all, the, all the building materials will have some sort of off-gassing. Could be good, could be bad, and so on and so forth. You're probably are storing stuff in your house that you shouldn't store. So you don't want your air picking up all these materials and then you come and breathing. So that's why uh, buildings don't need to breathe. Now we're going to get into the actual physics. We talked a bit about heat flow. But before we, we do that, we've got to think of how a building operates. And this is something that um, we see time and again. Buildings are systems, and they're complex systems. And so somebody comes along and tells you to do something a new way, has a new product, and so on. Every time you change something in a building, there's a reaction. Hopefully good. Could be bad. And you've got to understand the difference there. So, if you just simply VE something out without looking at why it's put in there, how, how it works, what's the impact and other things, good luck to you. Make sure your insurance is paid up. The other thing with buildings is we have a tendency to think of buildings as a building envelope, and that's critical. There's no, no question. But we also have to bring, breathe in, uh, bring in, I should say, uh, the mechanical system. And we got an issue with ASHRAE because the mechanical people, at least the people that come to ASHRAE meetings, don't believe that the, the building envelope does anything. So I've said, try and put your furnace in the middle of a street and see how it works. <laughs> um, so that, that has to be considered. And I've been asked time and time again, get the mechanical people talking to the building envelope people because they need to work together. And then we throw people in there. Why would we consider people part of a building? People come and go. You guys are here. Are you part of the building? Yeah, because you screwed up. You're a unvented combustion appliance, okay? And so moisture is a, a pollutant. In your home, as long as you don't mop your floors with liquid water or store cordwood for your fireplace in your house or dry your clothes on a line in your house, you are the biggest polluter of moisture in your house. And then you go and you do the thermostat, you can really destroy it. If you want a building to work, just keep people out of it. It'll work really, really well. <clears throat> the other thing we like to get across, we keep thinking about inside and outside. In ABBA, we really try and not to think that way because there could be reasons to have air barriers inside a building. In fact, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts said back in 2001 is you have to have one if the environment is 50% different. So, Anybody want to guess at where you would want an air barrier in a building? No wrong answers. I hear some murmurs. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It depends. It depends. <laughs> See? You get a building science certificate. Outbound is cheating. Outbound is cheating? Yeah. But that's going to be inside to outside. Why would you want one inside? What about, you ever been in a hotel? with a swimming pool? You really want to sleep in the swimming pool? You want a different environment there. How about you go to the hospital? Your room is right next to the infectious disease part of the hospital. Wouldn't it be nice to have an air barrier there? Okay, and you can go on and on. We have semi-heated parts of our buildings. We have, um, you know, probably the, <laughs> the best example is our Center for Disease Control. We don't want things leaving a room, let alone the building. So there's lots of reasons. The other thing that's coming up uh, and getting more and more attention is noise control. There is people that are being sued, builders and architects, because noise control. So what does that got to do with air barriers? Yeah. You're hearing me because there's sound waves going through the air. Now, an air barrier won't stop the deep um, sort of noises and things like that, 
but they will stop about 90% of the sound. And if you take a look at even the code for sound control, you've got to put in, basically it's air barriers, they don't call it that. Other things that um, they're being used now for is smells. Do you really want to smell the secondhand cigarette smoke, which is, happens to be a big uh, reason to sue somebody? You don't smoke, your neighbor does. Do you really want all his secondhand cigarette smoke into your building? What about cooking smells? How about insects? I was at a conference down in Florida and they had a, a company had all their products, insect control. Looking at it, it's all air barriers. A good friend of mine, he's passed away. He used to go in retrofit buildings, make them airtight. That was his business. Did a really good job at it. He always used to joke that he, he carried fly larva around and put it out around the buildings because he would get lots of work because um, there was a particular type of fly that would find the small holes and come in the buildings. Best example, City of Toronto has a 33-story city hall building. And this chap's name was Tony. Uh, he wanted to go in and retrofit it. He saw that it leaks like a sieve, like four layers down in the garage. If somebody spilt gasoline, they would smell it on the 20th floor within five minutes. So you know there's air leakage. He tried, he tried, he tried, couldn't get City Hall to sign off on his contract. And then he called, get a call one day, can you he be here tomorrow? Typical, right Matt? People phone you and want things done next day. And he was a little, not going to turn it down, that's for sure, but he's a little bit, um, why? Like, what changed? Anybody want to take a wild guess? The mayor's office was on the 33rd floor. She came in one morning, and there was a raccoon on her desk. Okay? Building got fixed. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, what we're trying to do even today here, is we have an outdoor environment, we've got an indoor environment, we want you know, 35 to 50 percent RH. Um, and by the way, we've got a whole standard of telling you when you feel comfortable. I figured just fuel around, see if you like it. Anyway, we got, we got those conditions, outside could be whatever it is, and so we want a barrier. And the greater the difference in temperature and moisture and so on and so forth, the greater the loads in our barrier. So we need the biggest barriers when we have the highest pressure difference, the highest loads, whether it's vapor pressure or liquid water and so on and so forth, because nature wants everything to be equal. If you've got a glass in front of you, whether it's cold water or, or hot coffee, if you know if you leave that long enough, it's going to go to the same temperature as this room. Same thing with pressure, so on and so forth. So that's the reason to keep two different uh, environments even within a building. We also want to get across because we see a lot of people focusing on walls. But there's six sides to the building. So if you don't do anything about the foundation and if you don't do anything about the roof, it doesn't matter. Try and blow up, take a balloon, cut a hole in it and try and blow it up. Never going to happen. And the biggest uh, leakage area that we've seen you know, over the last uh, 17 years is our connections. The roof to wall is number one, wall to windows is number two. Everything else is, it sort of comes in after that. So we've got we to gotta keep in mind that it's all six sides. And I take you back to, I don't care, take the, take the time, the year, we've always had air barriers. You know, whether you go back to the caves and, or if you go to the log huts or whatever, or you go to modern buildings. Here's a good example of stack effect though. You may, this is snow here by the way, and I don't have to explain that. Go down south, I gotta explain what snow is, but. Um, bottom of teepee is off the ground. It's cold out. Why would you take the bottom TP up off? That's going to let the cold air in, right? What's the purpose of that? What did they typically have inside a TP? A fire. Great smoke. Carbon monoxide, all the list of things. You don't want that. So back years and years ago, centuries ago, they understood building science. They said it depends. And they had a flap that you could open up here. So the cold air would come in here it would push the warm air from the fire along with the smoke out the top. They understood building science. They'd applied it. Here's what you guys do. So in addition to breathing, so if you want to cut down a moisture problem, you got a moisture problem in your house, don't breathe. Pretty simple. Um, but also how you treat it. 
we go to the thermostat and we expect the thermostat to solve our problems. And you're either too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry. That's, that's what makes you comfortable or uncomfortable. So we go to the thermostat and we change the temperature and we expect instant gratification. What we have to keep in mind is that the temperature of the air around you is about 30% roughly of how you feel comfortable. The other 30% is the moisture in the air. Why? It's our bodies, evaporative cooling. So if we're hot, we sweat, and when we sweat, that liquid water turns to vapor, evaporates, evaporative cooling, and we know when we have a phase change in liquid water, we, we suck in a tremendous amount of heat into that water as it changes the phase. And it doesn't change the temperature, it just changes the phase. So if we're in a building that <clears throat> is very dry, we're going to have more evaporated cooling from our bodies and we're going to feel uncomfortable. We go into a building that's a lot, got a lot of humidity into it and we're not going to feel right. What does your air conditioner do that helps you feel comfortable? More than changing the temperature. It takes the water up. In fact, there's a company that's going around the United States saying forget an air conditioner, just get rid of the water and you'll save all the money. It's not necessarily wrong. And then the third reason, the other third, so we got a third on, on the air temperature, got a third on, our mo on how much moisture is coming out of our bodies. What's the other third? Anybody want to guess? Drafty gets into the, uh, the evaporation. It's the surface temperature of the things around us. Okay, because in addition to an unvented combustion appliance, you're a radiator. So you're 98.6, the wall over there is, I don't know, 70 degrees. So you've got a temperature difference. We know hot goes to cold by radiation. And it doesn't work in this building, but if you had a nice, if those windows out back went right to the floor, if you stood in front of those windows and then you moved over where there's not a window, you would feel different. Air temperature is the same, humidity is the same, everything's the same, but the temperature of the surface that you radiate heat has changed, and that's why you would feel warmer beside the wall versus the window. And then we put mechanical systems in, and they can help us or hurt us. They basically add or remove heat, add or remove moisture, or move things around, or create pressure differences. And they obviously we need them in cold climates, we need them in hot climates, and so on and so forth. Uh, but we need to tie that into what we're doing and how we're living there too. I put this slide in because it's easy to come here and you can understand mold and mildew and frost and things like that. And the codes say for zones one, two, and three, you don't need an air barrier. At least the I codes say that. Because you only save 10, or 10 to 15 percent where up here we say 30 to 40 percent for an air barrier. Now, one code hearing, one of the committee members said, you know, everything else that we're doing, we're talking at 1% and less, and you guys are arguing whether it's 10 or 15%, like, where's the logic that? But one of the reasons that I show this slide is, what is the number one reason you would ever put an air barrier in your building? Number one reason. Moisture, yeah. And the first time air barriers were put in the code is uh, in the National Building Code of Canada, it was 1990. And at that time, the NBC had no provisions for energy. So you couldn't talk about energy. It was all life safety. And so it was put in, an air barrier requirement was put in the code because of moisture, condensation basically in walls causing mold and rot and corrosion and all the rest of this stuff. So <clears throat> I show that because this is Miami. This is an ASTM meeting. 8 o'clock in the morning, and the windows are just covered with dew. And if you walk on the grass, your feet get wet and all the rest of the stuff. Well, stop and think about that. That day, it's going to be about 95 degrees. Relative humidity is going to be between 95% and 98%. Inside temperature is going to be about 74. 35, maybe 50% relative humidity. What's going to happen to that building if there's air leakage? Hot, humid air outside leaking into a building that's cool. Okay, next time you're down there, look at the dew temperature versus the outside air temperature. Sometimes it's two degrees difference. 
In fact, some of the uh, manufacturers have requirements that you've got to have a temperature difference between the dew point and the outside temperature or you don't put their material on because they know there will be slight condensation on the substrates which screws everything up. So next time you're down south and you're in a hotel room and the hotel room smells musty, now you could get thrown out and charged but go ahead and do it anyway. Pull the vinyl wallpaper in the corner and it's black. That's mold, okay? Physics say keep the moisture out, keep the air. Now the black mold, you, everybody gets all excited about black mold. Black mold won't necessarily kill you, it won't actually help you. Worry about the tan and the gray stuff. That's the stuff you really got to worry about. So the whole point here is to show why you would put an air barrier. In fact, it's more important to put an air barrier down in Miami than it is here because of moisture. Now they don't necessarily save as much energy down there as you do here, but you've got to do the two things together. <clears throat> and then we see things that happen. This is out on the west coast and the first picture on, on your left is a combination of liquid water from the outside and, and water vapor from the inside. The other picture you see the standard black mold that's out there. Efflorescence. What causes efflorescence? Yeah. Moist, warm air going out of the building, going through the brick, picking up the salts, going to the surface, Salts don't evaporate. Water evaporates, leaves the salt. So it looks ugly. Is it a problem? You probably can't see it that well, but up here, you're missing moist, uh, mortar and you're missing bricks. Okay? There is a 12-story apartment complex uh, in Ottawa that they had to build a canopy over the sidewalk because the residents, as they're coming into their condo, didn't like the bricks falling on their head. Okay? <laughs> so that is damage that you can see on the outside, and fixing bricks is not cheap. This is a swimming pool, <clears throat> and you guys will recognize the, the sort of the red uh, material here. That's a snow fence, but you've got the green grass. Single story building. Again, we're missing bricks, we're missing moisture, but it's a swimming pool. And so the whole facade had to come down, be repaired, and the brick put back on. So we, this is good examples, but even better examples is the stuff you can't see because once they took the facade off, then basically the, the backup wall was garbage. I've been on some projects, you take the steel studs out in handfuls. Okay, not a good thing. <clears throat> this is a, yeah. No. Now, to be fair, these buildings, and this one is the same issue, these buildings are about 30 years old. And so 30 years ago, we didn't care. And part of the problem is we're asking more and more performance of our buildings, and we haven't changed the building. So this shouldn't be a surprise. And here's another example. This building, if you take a look at this, uh, the uh, backup wall, you don't see much on it. Okay? Now, originally, there was something put on there that is water-soluble. Okay? water gets on buildings. We've got to keep that in mind. So in this case, this is an art museum. This is limestone. These are five foot by three foot panels, four inches thick. And what you're seeing is now two, two inch thick panels. Below here is a public sidewalk. There was an inspection being done on the building. They weren't really looking at the facade, but when the guy leaned against the building and the building moved, he got off the scaffolding pretty darn fast. So again, everything had to come down. Oh, and by the way, the hypothesis was warm, moist air coming from inside the building, saturating the back half of, of the limestone, freeze-thaw conditions, cold climate, combined with, for some unknown reason, they used iron for the pins. What does iron do? Rust. What does rust do? Creates a tremendous pressure. So the hypothesis between the two of them, we split it in half with the outside half being held in place by the caulking. Go ahead. I see a cavity in between that yep. structural wall. Was it invented? No. It was, it was a, it was a, there, there's a cavity, a rain screen cavity. That was originally designed, but there's basically nothing behind it. No, I mean, was it invented at the bottom with weeps? No. Not, not to what you should do. You're going to see a presentation this afternoon 
and why weeps and venting is really, really important on there. But again, it's a 30-year-old building. We, we put stuff up. And this is, a, as an art museum, it's a high performance building. It's going to have, have high relative humidity to keep things proper and so on and so forth. But we feared the guys 30 years ago, that wasn't uncommon. And actually, in this city, every, every um, building that was built 25 to 30 years ago under, underwent the same thing. What city? Yeah, Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, okay. um, <clears throat> this is a swimming pool again. Now, the difference, you see a lot of, you go on, on, the, on the internet, you can see a lot of really cool pictures of icicles, and they're huge, and they're coming down. Most of the ones that I saw in there are uh, freeze-thaw on the roof. So your snow melts on a nice day, drips down, freezes at night, and it builds. This is not from the roof. This is from the connection between the wall and the roof. And you got the icicles going down there. Again, number one leakage, roof wall connection. This is up in Albany. Standard efflorescence. We went through that. But the interesting one in this one is this is the north side. Picture I have on the south side, there's no efflorescence. Same temperature, same climate, same building. Why? What's the difference? Yeah. Now we got the sun working down. And one of the things you've got to be very careful with is you get solar driven moisture. So if you have anything that is, we call it a reservoir cladding, stucco, uh, any cement product, brick and so on, it will suck in the water. We get the sunshine on there, that sunshine, the energy from the sunshine will drive the water through the wall. Okay? And we can get um, in cavities behind this, I've seen when it's been about, I'm going to say, five degrees out, I've seen temperatures in the cavity behind the brick of, of uh, 80 to 120 degrees. Okay, so that's something you have to be concerned about. We get into, we have this whole fixation on vapor permeable versus impermeable these days. And we got one manufacturer who goes, oh, I'm seven, and somebody else goes, well, I'm 7.1, and so on. Who cares? Okay, but uh, we should be talking about, you know, one in 100 and 500, not 10, 5, 6. But the one thing you have to keep in mind is that if you get all excited, you want a vapor permeable on the outside, and that's a good thing to do. We want moisture to go through it. Keep in mind, moisture goes both ways. State of California phoned us. We had a manufacturer. Uh, they had a 10 perm minimum requirement. They wanted, they proposed to raise it to 30 perms. Some reason just happened to match the material that they were selling. Um, and so the California phoned us and said, well, what do you guys think? And, well, I mean, you guys are the law, you can decide whatever you want, but keep this in mind, you do do secco down there, you actually do get rain down there, and if you're going to have 30 perms to allow moisture to go out, you're going to have 30 perms to allow moisture to come in. Their decision wasn't to change uh, from 10 perms. Heat flow. We already said heat goes from hot to flow, uh, hot to flow. Heat flows from hot to cold, and it's actually a really simple calculation. You can, you can determine the heat flow of anything that you have out there. You can go to the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals. It'll give you the heat flow calculation for a particular material. It's the area times the uh, temperature difference times the, equa or the number that you get from ASHRAE. And you've got your heat flow calculation. Pr pretty simple. Uh, it was surprising. Uh, one of the contractors we talked to, they asked their door manufacturer uh, you know, how they would calculate the heat loss, not just the R value of the door, but how much heat goes through the door, and the salesman didn't have a clue. Um, but it's pretty simple. The greater the temperature, because it's times the temperature difference, the delta T tells you how much heat flow. So the greater the heat flow comes from the greater uh, temperature difference. And we talk about heat flowing in conduction, convection, and radiation. Anybody would like to give me a, an example of heat flow by conduction? Go ahead. Through an electric wire. No. Yeah, you're going to get heat generated in the wire. Electricity is going to flow it. Keep it simple. It's just contact. So you take a piece of anything. doesn't matter what it is. Every material has a fleet heat flow value. And it's heat working its way through it. And when it works its way through it really slowly, we call those insulators. And if we use something like copper or steel or aluminum, that transfers heat really, really fast, we call those conductive. But it's heat, and the molecules have to basically get excited on one side and work their way through to the other side. 
So it's a relatively slow process, relatively. If we go to uh, convection, um, so this is the conduction and we use thermal insulation. Oh, by the way, fiberglass or glass fiber insulation made from glass. How good an insulator is glass? Not a good one. Windows are our worst performing part of our walls. So what magically happens when we take glass and we spin it into cotton candy? Oh, you guys are learning. Yeah. So air is actually a good insulator. And so when we put glass fiber in our, in our um, buildings, it's a good insulator because it's dealing with our next subject, which is heat flow by um, convection. And heat flow by convection is you've got one surface, you've got another surface, and it's heat flowing from this surface through a medium. could be air, water, anything that moves to the other surface. Okay? And so we use glass fiber in stud cavities to stop a convection current. Because if air is a good insulator, why don't we just have 12 inches of air? Well, once you get past about 3 sixteenths of an inch, you're going to set up a convection, or I should say 5 eighths of an inch. You're going to set up a convection current. It's going to pick up heat from, the out, from, the, from this side. It's going to become more buoyant. This side, the air is going to cool. It's going to drop down, force this up, and you're going to get uh, convection current. The reason why that's important is that the heat flows much faster by uh, convection than it is conduction. If you didn't have this convection current, the heat would have to work its way through the molecules in the air to the other side, and you'd actually have pretty darn good insulation. There was one insulating company years ago, their product came in, um, you know, um, three and a half inches by 14 and a half inches, and you basically you stapled in the bottom and you pulled it up and it was, all it was was just little pockets of air. Technically it worked, except that, you know what, we don't do things within a millimeter on the construction site, so then you had a space on one side and the next one you had it squished and so on. So the product never went anywhere. And we have convection ovens and here's the example with um, a window or a wall, doesn't matter what it is. You got a, a hot side, you got a cold side. Um, what is the m typically maximum width in a dual glazed or triple glazed window it's between panes of glass? Half to five eighths. Never going to see anything less than three sixteenths. You're never going to see anything more than three quarters. Typically, it's half or, or, or five eighths because of the convection current. Now, we used to draw, draw a slight vacuum because vacuum is a good insulator. Remember the old thermos? You take it to school, at least I took one. And you could have hot soup in there all day. Came home after and it would be there. Uh, fantastic. It was a vacuum uh, thermos bottle. So nowadays we're putting in argon and now we're even moving to krypton and so on and so forth. And the best part of your window is the center of the glass. The frame sucks. Okay? And so we, we need the overall requirements that are on there. But we can now move, we've moved from R1 in windows. We can now produce windows that are R8. And we should be excited about that. Okay? Now we go to the wall and it's R, what is this area, R21, R26, somewhere in that range. So it doesn't look like a lot, but we've got to keep in mind that to cut the heat flow in half, we've got to double the R value. So you get a curve. So R1 to R2, if you had 100,000 BTUs, you go from R1 to R2, you're down to 50. R1 chopped off 50,000 BTUs. Cut that in half, now you're saving 25,000. You're up to R4, 8, 16, 32. When you get past Somewhere around 35 to R45, it's almost a straight line. Law of diminishing returns. So we get excited about going from R1 to R2 to R8 because we're actually saving a tremendous amount of energy. That first part is when we save the most. Ra uh, heat flow by radiation. Anybody give me an example? Sun. Sun. Based example there is. Heat transferring from an object to another object without heating, heating up the space in between. We know the temperature of the sun is, you know, nine zillion degrees. And, and we got the earth that could be in a hot day, 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees. And we know if we fly in an airplane, it's minus 40, minus 50, sometimes minus 70 if you want to get in some areas. So the heat comes from the sun. The key thing is how fast does this heat travel? Remember back in school days? What's the speed of light? 186,000 miles per second. 
So this becomes important because heat flow by radiation is the fastest way we can transfer heat. That's why we, we feel. So you, you, you know, let's throw in ra radiant barriers and so on, and they do have a purpose. Just be careful of the claims of some of the manufacturers. It's not an end-all. I saw one company that took a radiant barrier foil, basically, wrapped an expanded polystyrene. An expanded polystyrene is about R3.8 and claimed it was R52, equal to R52. They're very careful in the wording. It's baloney, so be careful out there. So the sun, um, also if you had a fireplace or if you have a fire pit outside or something like that and it's cold, somebody can, comes and stands in front of you, you're gonna feel different because he stopped the heat flow by radiation. Airflow, you should be getting the point hot to cold, wet to dry, high pressure, low pressure. Uh, we got pressure differences, size of hole and location. We're going to get all sort of different pressure differences in our buildings and obviously the bigger the hole, the more moisture uh, and the more air, I'm sorry, that's going to go through there. And we do, we create these uh, pressure differences from stack effect, wind effect, flu effect and, and ventilation. Stack effect, we sort of looked at the TB, TB, TP. It's cold air coming in the bottom, pushing hot air out the top, okay? How much, stack, uh, how much we get depends on the temperature difference and the height of the building. Higher the building, colder the temperature, we're going to get more stack effect. So in the wintertime, normally it's cold air coming in the bottom, hot, hot air going out the top. In the summertime, it reverses. We now take hot air in the building, we cool it, that falls down. And so we now got air being pushed out the bottom of the building rather than it being coming in. Uh, wind effect. We got high pressure on the windward side, low pressure on the leeward side. Where is the highest pressure difference in a building? L windward, leeward? I already told you the answer, by the way. Yeah, so it's going to be on the leeward side, top or bottom? Top. And at the corners. So we know that if we have, um, we measure wind at 30 feet. And so if we had a 300 foot building, whatever the pressure is at 30 feet, it's going to be almost six times the pressure. Same wind, same location, same day, everything else by height. Um, so, and then at the corners, so at the top of the building we have the highest wind flow, and then at the corners we also add the vortex. Again, going back, who cares? We got to be concerned about the wind sucking our materials off the buildings, not pushing them on the building. It's pretty easy to keep the material if the wind's pushing it on. Pretty hard to keep the material when the wind's trying to suck it off. And then we throw in the mechanical equipment which moves air around and they can create pressures. And one of the things that we're learning is that um, if you have a really good building envelope, your mechanical equipment works so much better. The, the key here is that we talked about these things individually, but in real world, we combine three. So if I, if I had a, um, a uh, whiteboard to, to write on, I'd show air coming in and air going off, and when I'm done combining the three of them, you don't know what the heck I did. And that's really the point. We can't pinpoint whether air is coming in. If you've got air coming in on one side because of wind effect, and then you've got air um, going out the other side, um, or if you've got the two coming in, it's going to amplify it. If you've got one coming in and one going out, it's going to cancel the, the two of them off there. Moisture. Now, moisture, we said, is the most critical thing that you can do um, and why you put an air barrier out there. So we have moisture as solid, liquid, and gas. Do we have a problem if we have solid moisture in our building? Yeah. Do we? If you had a big snowstorm here and you had a gable in vent and the snow came in and covered your, your insulation, your attic, would, at that day, would that be a problem? No. No, it's actually it's good insulator. What's the problem? It melts. Same thing with the gas. If, if the moisture in this air could cool down and never turn to a liquid, you don't really have a problem. It's liquid where we uh, provide the, the moisture and the, the everything that we need for rot and mold and mildew and so on and so forth. So we talk about moisture moving, I say down, up, sideways, and anywhere it wants. So if we talk about gravity, we got flashings and shingles and all these things that we put on the outside of our building to deal with moisture going down. Then we have capillary action or wicking action. Concrete's porous. A lot of times um, you can have moisture going up concrete. 
depends on your local conditions here, whether that's a problem, not a problem. Um, we have diffusion, that's why I say sideways, that's what we already talked about, the water vapor in the air going through materials, working their way to the other side. Um, I've been told I'm out of town, uh, out of time. And so I'm not going to, this is in the presentation, the whole point here is if you take a look, let's go back to the two foot hole. One perm is 57 nanograms, a nanogram is a billionth of a gram, a penny weighs about two to three grams. So take a penny, take a third, divide it into a billion pieces and then take 57 and that's how much water we're talking about. If you look at constant pressure, which is never in a building, so this is the absolute worst case, you're never ever going to see it, calculate that all out. Per stud cavity, per year, depending on 0.1, 1 or 10, and let's take the worst, 10, it's got two cups of water coming in per stud cavity per year. Is that a problem? In most cases, not, because remember I said you're never going to get two cups. So you're going to get a whole lot less because moisture goes in, moisture goes out, and all the rest of this stuff. And then um, also, too, we have some drying, everything. So in reality, and this goes back to why are we so um, concerned about vapor barriers if we're talking about teaspoons of water per stud cavity per year. Airflow, now this is, goes anywhere it wants. And air is either very smart or very lazy. I call it Brian Strike for it. And <clears throat> it looks at something and goes, hey, I've got to do a whole lot of work here. So it finds some place to go. So it'll find the hole by the electrical outlet rather than trying to work its way through the material. It can, but it takes a tremendous amount of time. <clears throat> and the other part is if you have um, straight holes, they're not too bad but no hole is every straight. You've got an electrical plug here and you might have a light outlet up there and so the air spends more time in the, in the building envelope, better chance of it cooling down. When it cools down, we get condensation. Um, this is a standard slide, everybody use it. It's basically showing if you had a stud cavity and you had no holes in it, okay, you would have about 0.13 gallons of water going through there in a whole year have a very small hole, three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch, and now you got 15 gallons. How much moisture by air transport, how much by vapor diffusion, what you use vapor barriers for. Here's what we're, why we're doing all this. We got mold damage, wood rot. The interesting part with this one, this is up in Minnesota. There was about 10 homes involved with this, and when you looked at these homes, they were pristine. There's absolutely no reason you would ever believe there's a problem. This house had stucco on the outside where you're seeing all the rot. There's no windows, there's no pipes, there's no penetration, so there's no reason you would ever believe that there's a moisture problem. The kicker is these homes are less than five years old and we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars of repair. The house was basically warm moist air going into the stud cavity, dropping the moisture. It drops it on the first plane of condensation which in a house is the inside of your exterior sheathing and we were rotting the houses from the inside, uh, from the outside in. Here's a quick thing that we're adding to our energy calculators, how much moisture. And this is why I go back to why you need an air barrier more importantly in Miami than you do here. There's a typical building and there's an airtight building. And the, and the one in Miami, that's 18 pounds of water per square foot per year. Water weighs 62.4 pounds, so 18 is about a third, it's roughly four inches. You're thinking, think of your building with four inches of water and every square foot of that building. Air leakage versus non-air leakage. Um, absolute humidity, and, and I'm almost done. Um, absolute humidity we don't really care about. We never talk about it, it's simply how much moisture in the air, and it's grams, it's ounces, it's pints, it's whatever you want. Relative humidity we're really concerned about. What is relative humidity? It depends, doesn't cut it here, by the way. <laughs> Moisture in the air compared to how much it can hold at that temperature. Okay? So if somebody comes along and says 35% <clears throat> relative humidity, so what? At what temperature? Why is temperature important? What happens to relative humidity as the temperature goes up and down? So 
temperature goes down, what happens to relative humidity? Goes up. Temperature goes down, relatively humidity goes up to it hits 100%. What happens at 100%? Okay. So outside, if you've got cold, dry air here, you bring it in your house, you're dropping the relative humidity because it could, it could be 90% relative humidity outside, but to warm that up from, let's say, minus 20 to 70 degrees, you're going to have maybe 5, maybe 2% relative humidity. You've got a moisture problem in your house? Open your doors. Keep the cat in, keep the kids in, keep the plants from freezing, but that's the cheapest way and easiest way to, to stop condensation on your windows and so on and so forth. Just simply open your doors, change your air. <clears throat> we talk about dew points and so on and so forth. Um, we're starting to move to more sophisticated calculations, Wolfy, those type of things, computer programs. We can do a lot better job now on there. So, in conclusion, every material has a heat flow. Every material allows water vapor to transfer through it at a certain rate. Every material has an air leakage rate. Um, every material will either absorb water or not absorb water, water resistive barrier, non water resistive barrier, and all those things go to be together for durability. And durability is one of the biggest challenges that's facing the industry right now because we're not quite sure whether a product is going to last 5, 10, 50, 100 years. We don't have the sort of the history behind it. So if these are the things that I'm hoping you're going to walk away. Keep thinking of buildings as systems. Don't think of an air barrier by itself. You have to think of the water resistant barrier, the heat barrier, and the vapor barrier. Combine the two of them because anytime you change the material in that, uh, that sort of combination of materials, you're going to change how your building works. You want to deal with the mechanical equipment and that can help you. But if you don't have a really good uh, building envelope, your mechanical system's not going to work. And finally, the whole, as we go to nearly net zero, and I believe we're going there, we can argue about what the date is, we're never going to get there unless we build our building envelopes the absolute best that we can to reduce energy use, to reduce moisture control. But as we do that, and we see this in Passive House, the more insulation we put in, that insulation actually works. And it works by stopping or slowing down heat flow. When we still slow down the energy that's going through our building enclosures, it slows down the drying potential. And so you're going to see problems with buildings because we're putting more insulation in, but you built them exactly the same except now you've got more insulation. So we've got to be conscious of that and we've got to do things to address those now rather than wait until our buildings literally fall down. Any final questions before I get roped off the stage here? I always go first, by the way, because then everybody has to make up the time that I use. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.